Hey folks, I'm John Hazlett. This is the interview. I'm here with Charles St. Pierre. Charles, good to see you, buddy. Hey man, how are you? Good, good. Th thanks for putting me up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, good to have you. It's always nice to come down. Good to have you. Yeah, so Charles is here for a spay class, which we're gonna do later today. So we, we uh, grabbed him to have a quick chat. And uh, Charles, when, when do we meet? Has it been 10 years maybe, spay clave? I want to say, yeah, that's probably been at least 10 years. I mean, we maybe at least, a little more. Yeah, maybe a little bit more. Yeah. So what's funny is that I used to work at the fly shop in the Ashland Outdoor Store. This is probably 2002. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing an old class schedule. Patrick Kilby. That Kilby, yeah, yeah, because yeah. when Kilby left to go to Idlewild, mm -hmm. that's when I came in. And he's with Sage now. And he's with Sage now. But I remember seeing your name in there and thinking, who is this St. Pierre guy? And then I met you a few years later. Just a ghost waiting to meet you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that was 2002 probably. So you've been in the spay game for a long time. I started spay casting um, 94, 95. And then I established um, uh, Northwest Spay Casting officially in 97. And okay. Georgie brought me in and started uh, doing classes for all the sage dealers in the Washington, Oregon area back in that day. And um, there's a lot of guys that teach, a lot more people that teach now, but at that time it was pretty much Georgie. And um, he brought me in and started dealing with uh, some of his dealers and he exposed me to them. And, and you know, as a guy who's really promoted this sport, you know, George is at the top of the list when it comes to promoting the spay game. And um, it's been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot from a lot of different people. And uh, I try to pass that on to the people that I do classes for and, and um, share that knowledge with people who want to get into the game. It's a beautiful sport. No doubt. Uh, did you have someone who introduced you to, spay, to, to the spay rod? Was there a mentor? Because back when you started, there weren't many guys in the yeah. Northwest doing it. Yeah, the first guy that ever put a two-hander in my hands was um, a good friend of mine and um, a mentor for sure was J.D. Love. Oh um, yeah. J.D.'s guide on the Olympic uh, Peninsula. He used to guide in Montana with uh, Jerry Seam back in the day and um, that's when they met and J.D. Uh, was responsible for putting the first one in my hands and showing me a lot of that stuff. And I've learned a lot from JD. He's been a, he's been an incredible uh, uh, mentor as well as a great friend. Yeah. Yeah. And then Georgie, you know. Sure. Um, sure. The very first class I ever took was from George. Really. Yeah. The very first yeah. class I ever took was from George. Uh huh. Uh huh. We did it on the Puyallup River and on Pierce the County, Puyallup River on the old Puyallup. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Awesome, awesome. And that was, yeah, I want to say that was 96, uh -huh. the very first class, but the very first time I ever started, you know, playing around with the raw was 94, 95. So it, it makes sense that you, you're, you know, you, you're a great long line caster. Obviously, being introduced to it when you did, you had to have been using long rods, long lines, and, and develop that, that style of casting. Yeah, I mean, at the time, there really weren't any um, spay lines per se. Um, I think the first wind cutters came out. Most of the guys that I saw were had double taper, you know, lines because those were the only lines that you, you know, that were available for most consumers, and um, they would take those double tapers and cut them, you know, chop them in half and flip them around, and um, you know, you lose a lot of grain weight, so you had to play around with what rod you could actually use to load it up. But um, yeah. yeah, there weren't a lot of, yeah, there weren't a lot of lines. And then we, Rio came out with wind cutter. Um, and then they uh, also had one um, called the accelerator that was a long mm -hmm. belly, long weight forward line. Mm -hmm. But there's been a lot of, you know, there's been obviously a lot of uh, evolution of sure. two handed lines. And then the Skagit's, you know, came onto the scene, so. Yeah, yeah. I've often thought that the Skagit line in some ways has propped up the fly rod, fly fishing industry 
uh, you know, if you think about what it's done for the sport, and yeah. if it wasn't for the Skagit line <laughs> being such a great tool, not only for fishing, but for getting started, uh, would we would we be having this chat right now? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, that was a big step for, um, I think, making it a lot of user-friendly, you know, um, applications. Um, it certainly um, is a lot more labor-intensive to pick up a long line and uh, change direction with it, as opposed to with the Skagit line. And then also being in tight quarters on smaller rivers with overhanging trees and things like that, long rods and and uh, long lines just don't really lend themselves to that. So yeah, the the short the short rods and the short uh, weight forward lines like the Skagit, and then some of the Scandi applications, they've they've really helped. Uh, evolve the the sport and make it a little bit more accessible for most fly consumers so and certainly led helped lead to the popularity of winter steelhead fishing you absolutely know, without yeah those types of line systems uh we'd be we'd struggle oh struggle Big mightily time. mightily yeah. yeah i think that's been one of the things as far as winter tactics go that's been that's opened a whole nother door um uh for uh, the kinds of flies that we use and the kind of water we fish. Um, it's not always the classic water, you know? Right. Um, and right. to be able to fish all of that water, um, as much of it as possible, um, you need to be versatile and you need to be able to, to um, you know, adapt. Yeah. Adapt. Yeah. Later today in our class, you're going to talk about winter steelhead tactics. Um, and, you know, like I said, winter steelheading has become more popular. What's a couple good thoughts about winter fishing for new guys? Well, I think there's a couple of things. Um, first and foremost, I think um, in order to be successful, the way I look at winter steelheading, it's kind of the, the, the bow hunting, if you will, yep. application for, yep. say, elk, you know, a big game animal. Um, it's, it's not the easiest way to do it. In fact, it's the most difficult way to be successful, but some people like that challenge and they yeah. want to be challenged. And if that's the, that's the motivation, then it's certainly the way to go. Um, the people that I see that are successful with winter steelheading, there's one thing they all have in common and it is their dogged determination. They never, ever stop. They never stop. Um, they never stop learning. They never stop fishing. Um, and I think that's, and having confidence is a big key mm -hmm. in that. Um, understanding the, the water conditions, you know, understanding weather and water fluctuations, that's another big key of being successful. Um, and then also, yeah, having the right gear and being able yeah. to use it. Yeah, yeah. Those are probably the three three big things it's a big equation to solve and everything can be right but you have to be there and the fish has exactly. to be in the mood yeah the timing of it has, to be, right. has to be right but the mindset i think is probably one of the most important things that everybody should kind of think about um and putting on that hat to determine and you'll see people throughout the day of winter fishing catching fish other ways but to swing up a fish is is to really 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 apply yourself and um, uh, be just steadfast in your in your commitment. And I'll tell you that you know when I first started steelhead winter steelhead fishing, I was using a single handed rod, mm -hmm. and it was the oddity at that time to see two handers on the river. And now we see a lot of them. It's more like the equations flipped over. Yeah. But I can tell you after casting. Um, a teeny 500 or a teeny 400 with a single-handed rod for two days straight, you know, your your rotator cuffs start to, you know, be an issue. And yeah. um, that's that's another thing that's been nice about this sport. It is a, it's an effective way to present the fly, but you're not working anywhere near as hard to do it. Yeah, yeah. Made it easier for us. Oh, without a doubt. yeah. Those without long doubt. days, you know, or even some of the shorter days where you're trying to cover the water um, and cover it effectively to do that. Um, 
with a two-hander is lends itself a lot a lot more than than doing single-handed lines or single-handed rods with um, with sinking lines and large large flies yeah yeah and you don't need a flak jacket and you don't need a flak jacket. <laughs> Crash helmet. You need eye protection. <laughs> you, you, you need, need eye, eye protection. protection. Yeah. 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 Every once in a while, I have that fly whiz by my face, and I think, all yeah. right, John. Yep. Yep. Don't not... forget to duck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good at ducking. Yeah. I'm good at ducking. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back with more from Charles St. Pierre. Hey, Will. You okay, man? Yeah, I just can't cast like I used to. Well, you know that's an old rod. So? So, a rod that old is really low modulus. It just doesn't have the power that it used to. So how come you still cast like the big huck? Because I got launch. If your rod is over the hill, you need launch, the number one selling male ferrule enhancement. Launch is a unique rod boosting formula powered by Huckafin a patented ingredient clinically researched to boost graphite modulus and energize the male ferrule. Just apply a few drops to the male ferrule and get ready to launch. For your complimentary bottle of launch, text HUCK MEGA to 123456. Launch can help you cast harder, longer, with more vigor, more passion too. Hey Will! Looks like launch is really working. Yep, I feel like a new man. We're back with more from Charles St. Pierre. You ever fished a hobo spay? We sell a lot of hobo spays, Charles. We sell a ton. How did you, what was your inspiration for that fly? And, I mean, it's it's simple, but it's just the design. It's it's everything about it is fishy. Sure. Well, I got one right here. Um, I guess I wanted to get a fly that provided a medium-sized silhouette, something that was easy to cast. Um, I love tying on Waddington shanks. I I always have. Um, they're neutrally buoyant and that, you know, you don't have to add a lot of weight to them to make them work. Um, and um, I wanted something that was going to have some movement. You could cast it with a single hander or a two hander. Um, something that you could fish 365, yeah. right? Yeah. Something you could fish anywhere um, at any time of the year, whether it was winter fishing or summer, fall, summer, fall fishing as well. Yeah. So that was kind of the inspiration. The materials, I mean, those are just influences from other flies. I mean, I love marabou. Um, it's pretty durable, has a lot of movement. The key with tying this fly is to not put as, put, you know, um, a lot of material on it. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, three wraps of, uh, of a marabou feather, four at the most is yeah. plenty. Yeah. Um, and then having some, uh, the body of it, you know, have some uh, flash to it uh, to create some you know, some silhouette and some right some light refraction from in, inside the fly. And um, what I've noticed about this fly when it's wet is it almost looks kind of translucent because you use the jumbo guinea um, as the hackle for the body, which is black and white, the natural, and then using the Amherst on the um, um, the top of the fly and around the fly creates this um, translucent, almost see-through silhouette. Um, you're looking at something that um, that is almost see-through. Yeah. yeah. You know, all right. So you have yeah. colors layered on top of of uh, themselves, and it's um, it's been a great fly, and it's uh, like I said, it's produced well for me uh, for steelhead as well as salmon fishing. You know, in Alaska. Um, I know guys that fish these flies for um, trout in Montana, you know, streamer fish, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. But it's, 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 it's fun to cast, um, easy to cast, and just an effective fly. Yeah, 
Yeah, just yeah. an effective flight of fish. Yeah, that's the and you can cast it with a Scandi line. Sure. If need be, and and if you tie one, you can always put lead eyes on it if you want to, or absolutely you know, tie it on a different shank with a cone head. You could do yep. whatever you want with the fly, but it, they they just they get fish. We sell a ton of them. It's always a go-to for us. Um, and you know, one thing, uh, I, I'm guilty of it. You know, we're in this. We've been in this intruder revolution, so to speak, for the last 10 years, and I'm guilty of, oh, I put my lead eye on, and then I go. Sure. And uh, so uh, it's a good reminder that we don't always need or want a right. weighted fly or a huge fly. Yeah. And uh, if the fly doesn't turn over, well, it's not fishing. Right. And uh, fishing a fly like the Hobo Spay. It's a lot of fun. I mean, I think fish see through their environment a lot differently than we see their environment. And um, I think stuff that critical things for me is like fit a fly that has movement. And when it's um, when the hydraulics of the water column are are acting and working on those materials that it that it kind of brings it to life. Um, as far as weight goes, I mean, yeah, I put small eyes on these um, works great. The one thing I've seen with um, using too heavy flies is it tends to neutralize some of the movement of the fly. Um, I think there's a real fine line between having a fly that's too heavy um, and one that's uh, not heavy enough. Um, typically, like when I fish um, an unweighted fly, I usually fish a pretty short leader, you know, two, three feet at the most. Mm -hmm. um, usually if there's with water conditions in the winter time, you've got color in the water more often than not. So those those flies I like to have a little more flash on or a little bit brighter materials. Um, um, but the key is to really have that movement mm -hmm. and and do and try to do little or nothing um, to the fly that would take that away from it. And one of the things is adding too much weight. Let my sink tip do the work for me as far as de yeah. depth penetration and drag. Yeah, yeah. That's a great reminder for people that a fly that's heavier is going to stabilize more. Yes. And your unweighted fly is going to, yep. the fly itself is going to move more. Yeah. But if you have a too heavy of a fly, you're relying on the materials to do the movement. Yep. Which can work, but maybe. There's a you, fine line. There's a fine line yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, there's a fine line. Yeah. Yeah, and some of your other flies, they look to me influenced by Atlantic salmon patterns. Oh yeah, the foxy dog for sure. It's um, it's uh, definitely influenced by the temple dog style fly. I mean, it's kind of where I got that idea. Um, it's not my idea. I just turned it into uh, a, a fly that uh, people would recognize, per se. Um, Temple dog is actually some is a, is a type of material that's very hard to come by because those animals are no longer um, uh, plentiful. So, um, but that's I use Arctic fox mm -hmm. in place of it, and Arctic fox uh, has beautiful movement when it's wet. Um, you don't need a lot of it once again um, to create that movement. Yeah, it's just critical that it has the movement. Yeah, yeah. And it's very durable. Arctic Fox is really durable, real durable uh, material. It has a lot of movement. Yeah, yeah. Well, Charles, it's been awesome chatting with you, my friend. Good to see you again, brother. Always. We'll have you down again. We'll look yeah. forward to it. Yeah, we'll come down and do another class and um, maybe catch a fish. <laughs> Imagine that'd that. Be, that'd be awesome. That'd be great. That'd, that'd be, be awesome. Great. Well, we have great winter steelhead conditions today. It's actually snowing if you can't see. Well, thanks for tuning in, folks. I'm John Hazlett. This has been the interview with Charles St. Pierre. Thanks again, bud. You bet. Anytime.